Yeah, welcome back. So before the break, we were looking at the Greek concept of logos, what they considered logos to be. So for them, logos was this divine being, which is pure. On the other hand, anything that has to do with matter, uh, anything which can be seen and touched, uh, which is non-spirit, all of it is evil and um, uh, corrupt. So for them, the idea of the divine being taking on material form would have uh, not made sense because they believe that if the divine came into contact with material, it would be contaminated. So John takes something which they are familiar with and he gives it a new angle. He gives it a new perspective. So he says, yes, the initial you know, um, belief that you have in this logos it contains a you know a, a, a little bit of truth, uh, your idea of the divine being. It contains a little bit of truth, but I will give you more details now regarding this truth. And so he goes on to say, this logos is not what you people think. This logos, he was with God in the beginning. He is God, and not just that, he literally became flesh. He took on a material form. And he came to dwell among us. So John goes beyond the uh, Greek belief of the Logos and presents the Logos in a whole new way. Now, when the Jewish people, when they heard of this word Logos, how would they have understood it? What, what, you know, uh, what ideas would it have brought to their minds? Even in the Jewish tradition, there was some idea about the word of Yahweh. Um, this is a concept which developed during the intertestamental period. You know, this is basically the time period be between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, during those that uh, 400 years uh, in between the Old Testament times and the New Testament times. During that time, there was a lot of writing which was done by the Jewish people. Uh, they wrote all kinds of books. Now, these were not inspired scripture. They just simply wrote out of their uh, human uh, understanding. And in fact, many of the writings which they wrote are very mythological. Uh, they talk about all kinds of um, um, all kinds of mythical creatures, things which are not real. Uh, so among those books which were written during that time, um, there were two books which were written. And in fact, now we regard them as apocryphal books because the Catholics regard them as uh, inspired scripture. But then uh, we of the Protestant community, we do not regard those books as inspired scripture. Uh, so these are the two books which uh, you know uh, talk about this idea of word of Yahweh, the book of Enoch and the another book which is called Wisdom of Solomon. Now these were written like around, you know, 100, 200 years before the coming of Christ. So in these books, it talks about something called the Memra of Yahweh. That word Memra basically means word, the word of Yahweh. So in the in this um, you know apocryphal book, Wisdom of Solomon, this is what it says. It says, you know, thine almighty word leaped from heaven out of thy royal throne. And it came as a sharp sword to us. Okay, that's in one of the um, one of the chapters in the Wisdom of Solomon. And then you have another verse where it says, "Wisdom is the breath and power of God, and a pure influence flowing from the glory of the Almighty." So this word of Yahweh, this memra of Yahweh, was considered the wisdom of Yahweh. And then in the Book of Enoch. A new you know, uh, meaning is given to this Memra of Yahweh, the word of Yahweh. Over there, it talks about the word of Yahweh as a white bull. Okay, these are all very mythical stories, not at all inspired scripture. But look at the way this concept is presented in the book of Enoch. I'll just read out you know, what it says. This is what it says in the book of Enoch. It says, 
the Messiah is represented as a white bull, which after having received the worship of all the animals of the earth, transforms all these races into white bulls like itself. And then the poet goes on to say, this first bull was the word, and the word was omnipotent. I'm very sorry. Very sorry. <laughs> In the book, book of Enoch, there's this idea which is conveyed that the Messiah whom the people have been waiting for, that this Messiah is like a white bull, and this white bull is the word. So in the book of Enoch, people kind of came up with this idea where the word of Yahweh is also the Messiah whom they are waiting for since the ages. So when John begins his gospel by talking about the word, they are already kind of familiar with this idea because of the non-inspirational writings you know, which people had come up with during the intertestamental period. Um, so both the Greeks and the Jewish readers would have, it would have caught their attention when you know, when John begins his gospel by saying, in the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and he was uh, God. Um, we'll dwell a little more on this uh, later, uh, but for now, um, let's look at the way the um, Jehovah Witnesses, you know, deal with this particular verse because like it says in their title itself jehovah witnesses they believe only in jehovah only in yahweh they regard only yahweh as divine they do not regard jesus as divine however when you look at the verse you know this is the way the word the verse is right it says in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god so it's talking about a Trinitarian God, where not only God the Father is God, even God the Son is also God. Jehovah Witnesses will not accept this. And so they modify the way this particular verse is written. So in their translation, which is called the um, New World Translation, in the New World Translation, this is the way they, they translate this particular verse. They say, in the beginning, the word was, and the word was with God, and the word was a God. So they say that Jesus is not really divine. He's like a lesser God, a lesser being. And the argument which they raise is that if you look at the original Greek Bible, over there it says the word was God. It doesn't say that the definite article the is not used over there. So you can translate it as the God or a God is the argument which they come up with. And you know, if you were to go to Bible Hub and if you were to cross check, if you look at the original Greek over there, yes, there is no definite article used. It doesn't say the word was the God. You know, the definite article in Hebrew would be ho. So it doesn't say ho theos. It just simply says logos, um, you know, theos. It doesn't say the theos, the God. However, these people, if they are holding on to this logic, they should apply it to all the other places in the Greek Bible where the word God is used, right? But they do not use the same logic in other places. Let's look at just another one reference to bring across this point. Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. If someone can just read out that, Matthew 5, verse 9. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. 
over here it talks about the peacemakers being called sons of theos over here again there's no definite article being used it doesn't say ho theos it just simply says god but over here they're not saying that they are children of a lesser god you know in this verse the jehovah witness translation claims that they the peacemakers are most definitely children of the almighty god so you cannot just change the rules of application you know wherever you wish so the fact is that in the greek bible there are many many places where when it talks about theos god it doesn't always use the definite article the in front of the word so sometimes it just simply says god in some places it says the god but whether it's just saying theos or ho theos it is understood that it is referring to the living god okay so um in john 1 1 when it says that the word was with god and the word was god it is referring to logos as the almighty god it is not referring to the logos as a lesser god okay so in case you know we have an encounter with any jehovah witnesses and in case they make this particular point then we can always explain to them uh, that um, the word theos is not always you know used along with a definite article but whether or not the definite article the is being used it clearly refers to the almighty god okay that's just uh, regarding a theological point regarding verse 1 now if we move into verses 3 to 5 uh, that's what we will look at next so if we can have someone read out for us john chapter 1 verses 3 to 5 please john 1 3 to 5 all things were made through him and without him nothing was made that was made in him was life and the life was the light of man and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it now here uh, john is beginning to describe what this logos has done and so he goes on to say that everything that has been made has been made through this logos in fact nothing has ever been made uh, you know which was not made by him personally so it declares that this logos is the creator of everything so if he has created everything then that means he was there before any of it was created which means that he is uncreated he is not a created being he is the one through which everything else came which means he existed before everything came so he is an uncreated being who has always been there he's infinite that's the implication which john is you know uh, getting across over here and then he goes on to say uh, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it so he's here he is referring to the logos is referring to jesus as the light who shines in the darkness and what kind of a light is jesus he is a light that no darkness can ever overcome he is not like your tube light you know which goes out sometimes he is not like just uh, you know a, a sparkly light which you have uh, at uh, you know concerts and big events once the event is over the light is shut down this is talking about an eternal light and when this divine light shines in the darkness darkness can never ever overcome it um what were we talking about we were talking about how the divine light who is jesus uh when he shines into the darkness the darkness cannot overcome it they cannot overcome him now this holds significance for us uh, if you see in verse 4, it says, um, In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. It is not saying that light is contained in Jesus. He is saying that Jesus himself is the light. And it's not just saying that life is contained in Jesus. Jesus himself is the life. Okay? It's presenting Jesus literally as the life and the light. 
and when he shines into the darkness the darkness cannot overcome him because we have we can have people you know of, of other faiths who claim and say even our scriptures talk about the truth even our scriptures you know talk about uh, things which bring life and hope um, and it is true to an extent all religions you know um, present belief systems which contain some truths in them and yes there are elements of light in all of their teachings but simply believing in those um, truthful teachings or you know holding on to those little glimpses of light that does not give a person life because the people have to place their faith not just in those true teachings or those true beliefs they need to place their belief and trust in a person who is himself the light and the life only that can impart eternal life to them so believing in a teaching which is true alone can only take you maybe a few steps forward maybe it will help you to withhold from you know committing crime or doing something very evil but if you want to have life in you then you would need to go beyond and you would need to trust in the light himself you would need to trust in the person who is literally the embodiment of light and life and um, which is why um, it says in verse um, seven it says uh, you know john the baptist who is giving witness to this jesus and it says over there um, in verse 8 that john the baptist was not that light but he was sent to bear witness of that light and that was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world so here it's talking about a person who is literally the light and the life and when you place your faith in him you are not just placing your faith in a set of beliefs but you're placing your trust in a person and that person has got the power to overcome the darkness why is this so significant for us because as long as we are in this world and even as we are going through our christian walk we are attacked by the darkness in so many ways you know it can come to us in the form of sickness it can come to us in the form of uh, financial difficulties um, darkness attacks us at every level in our walk you know in different ways but when our faith is in this person who is the light and the life the darkness cannot overcome him so as long as our trust and hope is in him he will make a way for us even when we are going through phases of darkness so that is the great hope which we have in fact this is what jesus says right about himself to his um, disciples uh, in john 16:33 he says to them very confidently this is what jesus says he says i have told you these things so that in me you may have peace in this world you will have trouble but take heart i have overcome the world so when people come to us and they say yes there's truth even in my religion yes there is light even in my religion they are talking about concepts they are talking about ideas which may contain elements of truth but can that element of truth wipe out the darkness in their lives can it overcome the, the issues that they are facing no because that's just an idea it's just a philosophy it's just a thought but the scripture this john chapter 1 is talking about a person who comes as light and life and when we place our hope in him he has the power to overcome the darkness so in him we have much hope okay so that is why john is urging his readers to become followers disciples of this light and this life now um, to come to that as uh, you know that word which is used over there the darkness has not overcome it if you were to uh, read that particular verse uh, which is basically your verse 4 john 1 4 if you were to read that verse in your niv it says the darkness has not overcome it 
If you read the same verse in NKJV, it says, the darkness did not comprehend it. Why is there a difference in translation? Uh, that's because that Greek word which is used over there for overcome, uh, that word is katalambano. You don't really need to know the uh, Greek word. But what does that word mean? That word basically, it can be taken in two ways. It can talk about overtaking or it can talk about grasping and understanding. So because of those two meanings which are there for that word, the NKJV prefers to use the word grasping and understanding. So it says the darkness did not comprehend it. On the other hand, the NIV takes the other meaning, which is overtake or overcome. And I think in this particular context, the NIV translation makes more sense because it's talking about how there is darkness. And when this light steps into the darkness, the darkness has to flee. It can no longer you know, continue to reign and rule. Uh, so this light of Jesus, uh, darkness will not be able to overcome this divine light. So I think the NIV is a better translation. Now look at the significance of you know, what is being presented over here. If you were to go into your book of first book, you know, the very first chapter of Genesis, it talks about how once, uh, you know, in Genesis 1, 3, uh, Genesis 1, 2 to 3. Yeah, if someone can actually read out that. Let's look at what happens when, uh, you know, at the time of creation and what happens at the time when Jesus comes. There's a, there's a kind of parallel which can be drawn between these two passages. So if we were to go to John, Genesis chapter 1, if someone can read out verses 2 and 3, please. The what the earth was without form and well. And darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. If you look at the beginning you know, of creation, if you look at the Genesis account, there, what do you have in the very beginning? The earth is without form. It is empty and void. And there's darkness everywhere. And then God enters the picture and God says, let there be light and there was light. In the same way here, John is presenting us to us Jesus the light. When before Jesus came into the world, all you had is darkness in the sense, you know, people were fallen. They were dead in their transgressions. Um, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 5 actually says that it says, um, you know, Christ has made us alive when we were dead in our transgressions. So before Jesus came into this world, before he came into the picture, people were dying in their sins. There was only destruction. There was only decay. There was no life. But when Jesus entered into the picture, he brings light and life in him. And when he brings that to, into the world, those who place their faith in him, now death cannot rule in their lives any longer. So that's the great hope which he is releasing to us. So uh, what God did in Genesis 1 brought physical restoration. Earth had no form, no shape. There was chaos. And physically, the earth was restored. Now, in the New Testament, when Jesus comes into the world, there is spiritual restoration, where earlier there was only death, decay, sin, and no hope. But now, when Jesus comes into the picture, there is spiritual restoration. So any person who would place their faith in this Logos, they would be able to live lives in which uh, darkness can no longer overcome them. Like Jesus says, yes, they will go through difficulties. They will go through struggles. But Jesus says, take heart, because I have overcome the world. So as long as we stay focused in him, on him, he will make a way for us, even in the darkest situations which we may face. Um, so in verses 6 to 13, um, you know, uh, John talks about this light in greater detail. He talks about the privileges which this light, this divine light has brought for us. Um, 
maybe we can just look at that entire chunk. Um, yeah, if someone can read out all the way from verse 6 up to verse 13, uh, John 1, verses 6 to 13, please. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to wear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to wear witness of the light, that light. That was the true light which gives light to every man who comes into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world, world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So he talks about this whole concept of Jesus being the light. He says John the Baptist, when he came, he was not the light. He was only testifying about the light. And he was testifying about the light, who would be the true light. And in verse 9, it says, that was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. So every person who has come into this world, who has been born into this world, has a choice to make. If they place their belief and trust in this true light, then the darkness cannot overcome them in any area of their life. On the other hand, if they continue to live without this true light, there are some areas maybe where they can conquer, you know, where they can succeed, but then there would be other areas where they would fail and fall because they do not have the true light, which alone can, you know, chase the darkness away. Um, and so these people who place their trust in him, they are given the special privilege of becoming the children of God. It says in verse 11, he gave the right to them to become children of God to those who believe in his name. And he says something about these people who have a special privilege of becoming children of God. He says they didn't earn this privilege uh, through the blood or through the will of the flesh or the will of man. They were given this privilege directly from God. Because the Jewish people had a lot of pride and respect for their ancestry. You know, they were the descendants of Abraham, the chosen one of God. I mean, God could have chosen absolutely anyone in the universe. But God chose this one person, Abraham. And from him, he created a nation. So the Jewish people had a great pride in their ancestry. And they believed that they are called children of God because of their ancestor, Abraham. But here, John points out to them, you know what? This privilege of being called children of God doesn't come through a man. Just because you're physical descendants of Abraham, that does not automatically make you children of God. The, the title of children of God can be given only to those who personally place their belief in this Jesus that I'm talking about. Only if you place your belief in this Jesus, only then can you become a child of God. So it is not by the will of man that a person can become the child of God, but only through the work which God alone has done. So he establishes that point. And then he moves into verses 14 um, and 15 where you know we, we touched upon it very briefly earlier about how the word became flesh and dwelt among us so yes if we can if we can have someone read out those uh, two verses for us verses 14 and 15 verse 14 and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we behold his glory the glory as the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth john bore witness of him and cried out saying this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Yes. So here um, it talks about how the logos became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we talked about how the Greeks would not have accepted this. They would not have liked this concept because for them, material is anything material is evil. And if the divine chooses to assume a material form, then he would be contaminated. That was their belief system. This 
um, verse would also have made the Jewish people sit up and pay attention. Because over here, a very specific Greek word is being used. It says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. That Greek word that is used over there is skenu, S-K-E-N-O-O. -O. That is literally the Greek word for tabernacle. So, you know, if you were to do a literal translation of that sentence, it would basically say, the logos became flesh and tabernacled among us. The tabernacle held much significance for the Jewish community because the tabernacle is where God's glory would come down and once the glory fills up the tabernacle, nobody would even have the guts to go inside the tabernacle. So it was something very sacred, very powerful, very holy. Um, if you were to look at Exodus chapter 40, verses 34 to 35, uh, this is what it says over there. Exodus 40, 34 to 35, if someone can read out. Exodus 40, 34 to 35, please. Then, then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting, and glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting, because the cloud rested above it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. In Exodus chapter 40, you know, after the tabernacle construction had been completed, everything had been set up, and then finally God finds it acceptable, and God chooses to come down into that tent, into the tabernacle. And once his glory descends into the tabernacle, it is so powerful that not even Moses is able to enter inside. You know, the man who is described as the person, the friend of God who spoke with God face to face, even he cannot enter into the tabernacle because the glory of God has filled up that, that tabernacle. Now, this Jesus has become that tabernacle. All of the glory of God, all of the divinity of God resides inside this Jesus. And he has come as that tabernacle to live among us. You see, in, in Old Testament times, once the glory would come into the tabernacle, nobody would have the guts to even go inside it. But here in the New Testament times, when this tabernacle comes to us in the form of a physical body, you know, in the form of Jesus, these disciples are able to talk to him, touch him, sit next to him, you know, offer him food. It's a very uh, down to earth version of the tabernacle, which is being experienced over here in the New Testament times. And so, when John the Baptist talks about it, he says, he who comes after me is, has surpassed me. You know, the NKGB doesn't bring out the beauty of that term over there. Uh, it says, you know, he is, is preferred over me. But that word, it's talking about a very high preference. Someone whose status is so high that their status completely surpasses, you know, John the Baptist's status. Because this person, this light, this tabernacle, he literally carries the entire glory and power of God within him, but he is so approachable. Even the, even the, even the most sinful person can come to him, kneel down before him and repent, and he will receive mercy. So it's talking about a very grand picture about how the Logos, who was there before the beginning, who was with God, has humbled himself and come down in all of his glory to interact with people at such an approachable level. And so, if he is that glorious, how can the darkness ever overcome him? Which is why there is much hope for those who place their trust in this, in this glorious Messiah. So, um, 
there are some parallels which are drawn between the Exodus passage and this John 1 passage. Um, Exodus 33, 34 presents one picture of the tabernacle and John 1, 14 to 18 presents another picture of the tabernacle. In Exodus 33, 34, you have a, a tabernacle made of cloth, of, of material. On the other hand, you have in John 1, 14 to 18, you have the same tabernacle being presented, but here the tabernacle is a person. And in Exodus, we see that Moses beheld God's glory. Here, it is the disciples who are beholding Jesus' glory. And in Exodus, we see that the law was given through Moses. But in John, we see that Jesus fulfills the law which was given to Moses. Um, so when it talks about John saying, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son, what did he mean? Was Jesus shining? Was he glorious in that sense? What did he mean when he say, we have seen his glory? Yes, there are times when Jesus, you know, was transfigured, you know, like on the Mount of Transfiguration. That would be in Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 and 2, where it talks about how Jesus was physically transfigured. His face shines like the sun. His clothes become as white as the light. But on a, on a daily basis, in what way did the disciples see the glory of Jesus? Was his face shining? Were his clothes, you know, um, radiant and white? No, they saw his glory in very practical and simple ways. The way he treated them, the way he spoke to sinners, the way he offered hope to people, the miracles that he did. So the glory was not just something that was shining and radiant. It was a glory which was acted out in the most simple, you know, uh, forms helping people, being a blessing to people. So those are the ways in which they saw the glory of God. This kind of, you know, um, gives us a new perspective of the glory of God. The glory of God, yes, is, is that very powerful, radiant, sovereign, supreme thing, which, you know, when people look at, they will literally fall down on their knees as though they are dead. So yes, there's that, that aspect of the glory of God. But there's this other aspect of his of the same glory, which is so people oriented, where God is using his glory not to frighten them, but he is using that to draw people to him and you know offering them hope. He is saying, if you come to me, my glory can be a blessing to you. If you come to me and place your trust in me, I can cause the darkness to flee so that the darkness does not overcome you. So uh, this, this this is other side to the glory of God, which we see presented over here in the Gospel of John. So even as we go through this, you know, um, go through this gospel, uh, you know, through the various chapters, we are going to see different pictures of the glory of God, you know, in Jesus. Um, we are going to see places where He does supernatural things. And we see places where he just simply interacts with people, talking to them. And in all of these different facets which we are going to see, we will catch glimpses of his glory. And that's the glory of the Son of God, which John presents you know, in his uh, gospel over here. So um, if we can just move into the last portion, um, maybe verses 15 and 16. Um, if someone can read out. Um, no, no, wait, 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 wait. Um, verse 16. <clears throat> because up to verse 15, he's talking about the, um, the glory of God. Um, and John the Baptist says that it has surpassed him. Uh, then we come to verse 16. Yes, if you can maybe read out uh, verses 16, 17, and 18. Yeah. 
six above sixteen, mm -hmm. and of His fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. Yes. So we have talked so far about the glory of Jesus, how He is the light and the life. We've talked about how the darkness cannot overcome Him. We've talked about how those who place their trust in Him will get the special privilege of being called children of God. You may be an ancestor of Abraham or you may not be an ancestor of Abraham. That is not necessary for you to be a child of God. If you place your faith in this Jesus, then automatically you get that very high privilege. We've talked about all of that. Now he goes on to talk about the grace and the truth which this Jesus is offering. Now this, is, this is the last portion of the prologue, the summary, you know, which we talked about. So this is the last portion of that. And here the point that he makes in verse 16 is he says, out of his glorious fullness, this is what Jesus is giving us. He gives us grace upon grace. Now this particular phrase, it's been translated differently in different English translations. Um, the NIV, it says, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. What is this phrase trying to explain? What is this phrase trying to express? Grace upon grace, grace in place of grace. What are they trying to say? They're talking about a grace which never runs out. It's like as if the grace which God has given you, if you're reaching the limit of it and you, you, know, you need more, more is already there. So it's grace upon grace. It's like uh, you're, 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 you have, God has been sustaining you and helping you through your situations. And now the new crisis has come. And what you have received so far is not going to be enough. Then immediately it's replaced by another grace, a greater grace, which you would need for this new situation. So over here, it's talking about how out of his fullness, of his glory, we are all receiving every day grace upon grace, grace in place of grace, so that we will never ever run out of the grace which we require. Now, the term grace is a very nice term, but what does it mean for you and me at a very practical level when we are facing the situations of life? It's talking about the strengthening which is given to us. It's something which we don't have in ourselves. We face situations which are too big for us. So at that time, this grace is given, this enabling is given, which will enable us to face situations which we cannot face on our own. It can refer to a difficult time that you're going through. Maybe it's some situation that you and your family are facing. And so at that time, you, you may think, I cannot bear this anymore. I cannot handle this anymore. I don't think I can go another day facing these problems which I you know which I'm going through. And at that time, his grace, his strengthening, his enabling is available to you so that you don't have to become discouraged or depressed. You will be able to get that spurt of faith which you need to rebuild your you know uh, faith in him and courageously go forward with singing and rejoicing. So that grace is given to you when you require it. In the same way, it can be situations where you're facing temptation. And you may feel that the temptation is too strong to resist. So at that time, that grace is that strengthening, that enabling, which is given to you to, to say no to the temptation, to reject the temptation and stay strong in him. So this grace is something highly practical. We kind of don't really know what this term means. And so we don't really make use of it. But, you know, Jesus, uh, um, Jesus wanted us to claim his grace on a daily basis, which is why in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, this is what it says about the grace. It talks about grace as a highly practical and necessary thing which we require for our everyday walk. 
So if someone can read out for us, we'll actually end with that. Um, so if someone can read out for us, Hebrews 4, 15 to 16. Hebrews 4, 15 to 16. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, what was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. There's a name given for the throne of God over here. That throne of God is literally called throne of grace. Because you're going to be needing grace on a daily basis for different situations. And you're supposed to go to this throne with what attitude? With confidence. Why should you go to this throne with so much confidence? Because out of his fullness, this Jesus is giving us grace upon grace. You never have to go to his throne and you know feel that, Lord, I will not be able to tackle this. When you go to that throne, this is the promise which is made to us. It says that we will receive mercy and we will find grace to help us in our time of need. So your time of need may be a tough situation that you're going through. Your time of need may be a temptation that you're facing. Whatever your time of need is, grace upon grace is being given to you by this Jesus if you go to him. So we are supposed to approach his throne with confidence because of what Jesus is providing us. And so in the last two verses, verses 17 and 18 in chapter 1, he says, the law was given through Moses grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. For the Jewish people, Moses was very important. The law which he had given was very important. But John is saying over here, yeah, the law is important. What Moses gave to you is important. But now here is Jesus Christ. He is giving you what Moses could never give. He is offering you this grace and this truth. So over here, this grace and truth, which is being talked about over here, that's the truth of the salvation message of grace, which Jesus is offering. Because the law which Moses gave, that could only convict you of your sinfulness. It could show you how rotten you are. Once you start looking at those 613 Mosaic laws, you realize how hopeless you are. So law can only show you how rotten you are and convict you of your sinfulness. But it's the salvation message of truth and grace which Jesus is offering, which can give you redemption, which can show you a whole new way of life. So here John is saying, rather than placing your faith in the law and in Moses, rather you should be placing your faith in this Jesus who has brought to us grace and truth. Okay, so these are just some of the um, thoughts that we could, you know, reflect upon today. Uh, let's just close with a word of prayer, please. Lord, we just thank you so much that all of us are here in the class today because uh, you have revealed to us about this Jesus. Lord, there's so much hope for us in our lives because of what Jesus has done for us. Thank you, O oh Lord, that we all have come to the saving knowledge of this Lord and Savior. And Lord, even as we go through this Gospel of John and learn new things about him, we pray, O oh Lord, that it would cause us to know him in a more personal way, in a deeper way, and it would lead to a stronger walk with you, O oh Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.